You guys will remember from last week that we learned the relationship between the displacement of a spring or an elastic and the force that's acting on it or the force that's pulling it back to its natural equilibrium position. And that relationship really is just the definition of simple harmonic motion. We say that F is equal to either Kx or F is equal to negative Kx. What's the difference between those two equations, by the way? It's a subtle difference. It's a small difference. Obviously a negative sign, right? But what's the difference in the meaning of the negative sign versus the positive sign? Yep. Good. The negative sign provides for us the restoring force, the force that pulls this system back to where it came from, and Kx is the applied force. So I pull on a spring with a force of 20 newtons, well, it's going to pull back to go to the equilibrium position with a force of 20 newtons in the opposite direction. Now, we found um, last week the force that was required to stretch something a certain distance. We sometimes found the spring constant given the distance and the force. Today, what we're going to do is use that in conjunction with an equation that we learned way back in unit two in our dynamics unit in order to find the energy stored in a spring or an elastic when it's stretched or compressed a certain distance. Do you guys remember that equation for elastic potential energy or spring potential energy? EP is equal to? Good. It's been a while since we've seen that. But it is, in fact, one half kx squared. Now, Sometimes, the question is really straightforward. You've got the value of x. By the way, x means what? It's, it's the displacement, yeah. It's the displacement. It can be measured in meters. Not the displacement, uh, how far does it go across the room, but rather how much is it stretched or compressed. What does k stand for again? Yeah, it's the spring constant, the elastic constant, whatever you want to call it. It means the same thing. And the units for that would be newtons per meter. And of course, EP is the elastic potential energy, the spring potential energy, and the units for that would be joules. Is the elastic potential energy, spring potential energy, is that, is that going to be a vector or a scalar? It's a scalar. All types of energy are scalars, whether we're talking about kinetic energy or gravitational potential energy or elastic potential energy or whatever. All right. We began saying just a minute ago that sometimes we're given all the variables we need to solve for the elastic or spring potential energy stored in a spring or elastic, but sometimes we're not. In fact, a lot of times we're missing the value of k. If we're missing the value of k and only k, how are we going to find the elastic potential energy stored in the elastic or spring? Where are we going to get the value of k from? Yeah, by using the Hooke's Law equation, k is equal to f over x, or f is equal to k times x, right? So what you'll do a lot of times is solve for k using f over x, plug it into the potential energy equation, and then solve for potential energy. Sometimes it'll work the other way around. Sometimes you'll need to find k using the potential energy equation, and then sub that into Hooke's Law to solve for the force. That makes sense? Spring or elastic potential energy is the energy that's stored in a stretched, compressed, stretched or compressed spring or elastic or something similar like the bumpers on the bumper cars that you guys are finishing up your assignment on now. The trampoline, you know, that you're jumping on over the weekend. Well, probably not because it was a little cold. You know that the more it's stretched to compress, the more the energy it stores. And you know, of course, that the higher the spring constant, the more energy it stores as well. If you wrote down what I wrote down on the previous page, you don't need to write down what I'm about to write down because it's the same thing. But if you didn't, then you should probably write this down now. EP is equal to 1 half kx squared. And again, this is the displacement in meters. Don't forget to square it. This is the spring constant or the elastic constant in newtons per meter. And we often have to find the value of k using Hooke's law, f is equal to k times x. Or the other way around, find it using 1 half kx squared and then sub it into Hooke's law. All right. Now I want to do an example with you on page 
301. This is from chapter 6. We're all over the place right now in chapters, right? Chapter 5, chapter 7. Now we're back to chapter 6 here. 6.4 on page 301 says, A spring is stretched to a position 35 centimeters from its equilibrium position. At that point, the force exerted on the spring is 10.5 newtons. What's the elastic potential energy stored in the spring? Really, we should say what's the spring potential energy stored in the spring, but it doesn't really matter what we call it. Same thing. If the spring is stretched... Sorry, if the stretch in the spring is allowed to reduce to 20 centimeters, what's the change in elastic potential energy? Uh, I'm going to put down the blue pen for a second and pick up the, the red board marker. How come I'm doing that? What do I want to draw attention to with the red board marker? Yep. Yeah, centimeters here. We know we don't want to be in centimeters either here or here. Now, you know what? I'm going to deal with question A first. I'm changing something, the displacement in question B. So I'm just going to deal with one thing at a time and write down the givens for that one thing at a time. In question A, I know that the force is 10.5 newtons. And I know that the displacement x is 0 0.350 uh, meters. And I want to find the potential energy. Now, you guys know at this point that you have two equations that you have available to you right now. Just like back in unit one, your kinematics unit, like two, a, a week or so into the school year, we learned the difference between group A and group B equations. We learned that there were five or six group B equations that we were allowed to use any time we had acceleration. It didn't matter which one you tried as long as you could put the givens in there and make it work. Same deal here. Except it's easier because we only get two of them. Instead of having to pick between five, we only have to pick between two. We have F is equal to KX. We have EP is equal to 1F KX squared. You're allowed to use either or both. Just pick one. If you think you have one that fits the givens better, then try it first. And if it doesn't work for you, then try the other one. And if that doesn't work for you, then try combining them somehow. Those are the only three possibilities that you can really see in these questions. What do you want to try first here? Uh, K is equal to F over X, so that's Hooke's Law. Uh, I was thinking personally, myself, EP is equal to 1 half KX squared. Why do you think that I was thinking EP is equal to 1 half KX squared first, Jack? Because it asked for the elastic. Yeah. I wanted to find EP, so I know in the end I'm going to use EP as a going on at KX squared, right? Now, in the end, I would have had to go back and find K, so it doesn't really matter what order you think of it in. Hey, solve for K first and then use EP equation, or use the EP equation and then go back and get K. It doesn't really matter. In the end, K is equal to 10.5 newtons over 0 0.350 meters. Do the division there. Works out to be, I believe, 30 newtons per meter. All right, even if I didn't need that as part of this question, which I do, I'm going to use it for the next part of it, but even if I didn't need it, I haven't done anything wrong here. Okay, that is the spring constant of this spring. So even if you don't need it, don't worry about trying an equation that doesn't give you what you want. Worse that happens is you just solve for something you weren't looking for. Now, as it turns out, I am going to use this so I haven't wasted my time at all. I'm going to plug it into this equation, EP is equal to 1 half KX squared. It becomes 1 half of 30 times the displacement of 0 0.350 squared. Now let's sub that into our calculator here and see what we get. 0 0.5 times 30 times 0 0.35 squared gives me a value of 1.8375. Or zero point, or sorry, one point eight four joules. Why did I write down the unrounded number there? Yeah, there is a question B. So just in case I need to use the value that I just solved for, I want to write down the unrounded number. Don't forget to square that point three five. By the way, okay, that's a common mistake. And as much as you might think, like, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to forget to do that. Okay. Um, there's a good chance you will. Just pay attention to it to, so you don't make that mistake. All right, question B says, if the spring is allowed to reduce, the stretching of the spring is allowed to reduce to 20 centimeters, what's the change in elastic potential energy? Well, I'll tell you what. We don't have an equation that solves for us the change in, in potential energy. All we have is potential energy. So we're not going to be able to solve for the change right away. 
we're going to get the potential energy right now when it's compressed 20 centimeters. And then what are we going to do? Subtract them. Yeah, if you have the initial and the final potential, then you can get the change of potential pretty easily. So I'm going to find this final potential here. It's going to be 1 half kx squared. It's going to be 1 half of x is 0.2, right? What's the value of k? It's still 30. There's a, f a pretty common mistake that people make here. People say that since the displacement is different, I got to change the spring constant. Oh, I got to go back now and solve for k. k is equal to f over x. The force is uh, what? 10.5 newtons. The displacement is now 0 0.200 meters. That's wrong. That's wrong. That 10.5 newtons doesn't go with the 0.2 meters. The 10.5 newtons goes with the 0 0.350 meters. Now, we don't know what the force is here in the second question, question B, but it doesn't matter. Once we find the spring constant, and once we change springs, then the spring constant is going to stay the same. So whether you use data, this data, 35 centimeters and 10.5 newtons, or this data, 20 centimeters and whatever the force it is that goes with that, it doesn't really matter. We'd get the same value for K, works out to be 30. You might as well just use the value you already found. Now, x is 0 0.200. Let's solve for that value now. Let's say 0 0.5 times 30 times 0 0.2 squared gives us 0 0.6. We're going to minus a 0 0.6, subtract 1.8375. It's final minus initial potential. And when we do that, We should end up with a value of negative 1.24 joules. We got a negative value there, a negative value. What does that mean? Uh, 1.24 joules to the left. Ener energy is a scalar. Because it's energy, you're, you're almost right there. Because it's energy, you can't really have a negative. You can have a negative. But because it's energy, you can't really have a direction. So what does the negative mean then, Isaiah? Yes, you've lost 1.24. Okay, it's not a direction here. Okay, this negative doesn't mean left, right, up, down, north, south, east, west. It just means you've lost 1.24. Delta anything giving you a negative value is a loss of that variable. Absolutely, absolutely. If you wrote down 1.24 joules lost as a magnitude, that would be okay. If you just wrote down 1.24, that wouldn't be correct. 1.24 lost or negative 1.24 would both be correct. All right. So what are the big takeaways from this question? Firstly, um, we see something that we very commonly see here, and that is that we have to combine k is equal to f over x and ep is equal to 1 half kx squared. That happens a lot. Okay, we're going to have to use one equation to get k and then the other equation to get what we're looking for in combination with each other. The second thing that I want you to take away from this, and this is probably the bigger one here, is that since we haven't changed springs from A to B, it's the same spring, we've got to remember to use the same spring constant. Okay, unless you change springs, k doesn't change. Even if the data is different, even if f and x are different, the spring constant will be the same unless you change the spring. Or unless you stretch the spring to the point where it's permanently deformed, right? You guys know what happened. You guys have seen that before, right? You take the little spring from the inside of a pen and you stretch it to the point where it doesn't work anymore. Okay, all bets are off then. But as long as the spring stays a spring, the spring constant stays the same. flip the page here and we have oh my goodness five questions that go along with this on page 301 we'll give you some time to work on those in class here right now all right we're going to take a look at question 3b from that page in fact we'll take a look at the whole thing question 3a and 3b 
Uh, three says the elastic constant for a spring is 750 newtons per meter. How far must you stretch a spring from its equilibrium position in order to store 45 joules of the elastic or spring potential energy in it? Um, and if you wanted to double the elastic potential energy or spring potential energy, how much further would you need to stretch it? Uh, we know that in this question, question number three, uh, we have two equations that we're allowed to use here. It's kind of like thinking about group A and group B way back in unit one, right? In this case, we're allowed to use F is equal to KX and EP is equal to 1 F KX squared. Those are the two equations that relate to springs and elastics stretching and squishing. What do we got here? We have K is equal to 750 newtons per meter. We have an EP of 45.0 joules. We want to find out what the value of x is. Which equation seems to fit those givens the best? f is equal to kx or ep is equal to 1f kx squared? The only two we're allowed to try. ep is equal to 1f kx squared. Good. Since, we're, since we've got the value of ep, let's go with that. Let's rearrange this to solve for x. You got a couple of options here. You can take the 2 over by multiplying 2ep, take the x or the uh, k down by dividing 2ep over k, or you can just take the 1 half k over all at the same time. Say ep over 1 half k is equal to x squared. Okay, how many people took the 2 over by multiplying? How many people took the half over by dividing? Same thing, right? Okay, whatever works for you is what you should do. X ends up being equal to the square root of EP over 1 half K, which is going to be the square root of 45 over 1 half of 750. So let's do that on our calculator and make sure that we can all get the right value here. Say 45, let's do inside the brackets first. In fact, let's do on the bottom first. 0. 0.5 times 750, 375, 45 divided by that. Gives me 0.12, and then let's square root that. We get a value for x of 0 0.3464 meters, which we're going to round to three digits, but we're going to keep the unrounded number there just in case we need to use that for question B. There's the displacement when there's 45 joules of potential energy stored in it. But now we're going to double the potential energy. We want to know how much farther it's going to need to be stretched. Clearly, if we're not changing the spring constant, which we're not, because as long as the spring stays the same, the spring constant, as you learned before, never changes, we've got to change something. It's going to have to be the displacement. We're going to have to stretch it further here. We're going to solve for x again using the same equation, EP over 1 half K. But this time, EP is not going to be 45 joules. EP is going to be 90 joules because we're doubling it, right? 90 divided by 1 half of 750. Let's square root that. Let's see what we get this time. Let's say uh, 0 0.5 times 750 again on the bottom. Let's say 90 divided by that. And then let's square root that. And when I do, I end up getting 0 0.48989 9 joules. Uh, sorry, meters should be. Now, that's not what I'm looking for, is it? That's the final displacement. That's how far you need to stretch it in order to get uh, 90 joules of elastic potential energy stored in there, right? What are you going to do to find the change? Yeah, final minus initial. How much farther we need to stretch it? That's a change. So it's going to be final minus initial. We're just going to say 0 0.489897. Minus what you start it with, which is 0 0.34641, the unrounded value there. We get uh, 0 0.143. Now, this one is a positive, right? First of all, this is a displacement, a change in displacement, not energy, like it was in the example question. But secondly, it's a, it, it, it's a bigger displacement at the end than it was at the beginning, right? So we're not losing displacement, we're gaining displacement here. Okay, the positive doesn't mean right or left. The positive means it's more than it was before. Is that all right? Okay, I'll give you one more minute to work on these questions, and then we're going to take a look at another example here. 
Now let's take a look at 6.6 .6 on page 304. It says, a man on a trampoline has a mass of 75 kilograms. At the instant he first touches the surface of his trampoline, of the trampoline, at its rest position, its rest position, he is moving at 8 meters per second. At his lowest point, the man is 0.65 meters below the trampoline's rest position. Um, what is that 0 0.650 meters given us here? Yeah, that's the displacement of this spring or this elastic or, well, it's really a trampoline, right? But it acts as a spring or an elastic here. What's the kinetic energy of the man when he first contacts the trampoline? Well, this is, this is not really a spring potential energy or a spring question at all. We're just going to say EK is equal to 1 FMV squared. We know his mass. We know his speed. We can find his kinetic energy. 1 half of 75 times uh, 8.0. Just going to square that. And when we do, we should get, let's see here, 0. 0.5 times 75 times 8 squared gives me uh, 2,400 joules. So his potential energy as, sorry, his kinetic energy when he first contacts the trampoline, it's 2,400 joules. We're going to round that to three digits, but we're going to keep the unrounded number there in case we need to use it later on. 2.40 times 10 to the 3 joules. Okay, this is a question that we could have easily done so far back in unit 2 back when we dealt with kinetic energy and potential energy for the first time. Now, question B says, if you assume that at its lowest point, all of the man's kinetic energy is transformed into elastic potential energy, what's the elastic constant for the trampoline? Um, what are we assuming to be true here? We're assuming that all his kinetic energy is transferred into or transformed into potential energy. What have we learned earlier on this year that we're going back to right now. Conservation of energy. Yeah, the energy that he has right now, which is 2,400 joules, is going to be the energy that he has in just a moment when he compresses the, the trampoline uh, 0.650 meters. Now, here's the thing. Right now, it's all kinetic because he's not compressing the trampoline at all. But in just a moment, it's going to be all potential because he's not going to be moving at all. We're going to say that EP is equal to 1 FKX squared here. And although we are allowed to use F is equal to KX, I think it's pretty clear that it's a potential energy question. We're going to say the value of EP is the same as the value of EK that we just saw for. Because as Isaiah just said, conservation of energy says that the energy remains the same. Total energy remains the same. It just gets transformed. We're going to solve for K here. K is equal to, I'm going to say 2 EP over X squared. 2 times 2400 divided by 0 0.650 squared. It's a pretty big displacement of a trampoline, right? Almost three quarters of a meter. Maybe this guy should uh, find a new trampoline, one that's built for his weight. Okay. Let's, let's solve for this here and see what we get. Let's say 2 times 2400. Uh, let's divide that by... 0 0.650 squared, and we get uh, 11,361. We're going to round that to three digits. We get 1.14 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. Anybody suggest to me why that's such a big value? It's bigger than most of the values we've seen so far, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the trampoline is designed to have a big spring constant, which makes it actually stiffer. Yeah, okay, there's a lot of springs attached to it for sure. And uh, a lot of springs with small spring constants add up to give me one spring with a big spring constant. Sure, but why do we want it to have that big spring constant? Why don't we cut the number of springs in half and have a lower spring constant? Yeah. You want to, first of all, be able to hold somebody that has 75 kilogram mass. And second of all, you, need, you, you want it to um, store as much elastic potential energy as possible to throw you back into the air. So it is a big value, but we would expect it to be a big value, relatively big value at least. All right. You have uh, three more questions now on page 304, in addition to the questions that you were working on today on page 301. 
If you haven't finished those questions, okay, they're due for homework for tomorrow. And also these questions on page 304 are due for homework for tomorrow.